Thank you, Simon. The International Forum on the Holocaust in Stockholm in 2000 reminded the world that the Holocaust was such a catastrophe, such a collapse of civilization, that it should never be allowed to fade into history but must remain at the front of our minds. Uh, I'm, I'm talking not just of the height of the killing in 1942 to 1945, but the whole tragic horror of the Holocaust era from 1933 onwards. The resultant Stockholm Declaration of 2000, ex accepted by nearly 50 governments, committed governments to promote Holocaust education, research, and remembrance, and to fight Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism. Out of that declaration has grown the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, of which I've just taken over the chairmanship from Canada. The Stockholm Declaration accepted a solemn responsibility to fight genocide and ethnic cleansing, as well as racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia. All the governments, whether now members of IRA or not, acknowledge the political and moral obligations involved. Now, IRA is a, an inter intergovernmental body, but is unusual in that it is, it is a forum in which government policymakers discuss with the experts of civil society what study of the Holocaust tells us and what needs to be done to ensure that nothing comparable ever happens again. When I say experts from civil society, I mean survivors, academics, educators, curators, administrators, and other non-governmental experts. I believe its impact and visibility is growing, as certainly is its membership. The concept of a crime of genocide, of course, grew out of the Holocaust experience, and revulsion Universal re revulsion against the Holocaust has been a major impulse behind the ever-strengthening drive since 1945 to protect and promote human rights under international law. One, one feature of recent years has been the growth and sophistication of the number of Holocaust museums and places of remembrance often initiated, initiated by civil society itself. The physical prevention of genocide uh, must, I suppose, largely be the responsibility of governments working through established international institutions and in accordance with the uh, growing strong public consensus behind responsibility to protect. Ordinary people around the world look to their own governments to protect them, not to persecute and kill them. But they are rightly concerned, too, that timely action is taken to prevent mass atrocities in other countries. They look to all governments to understand the pain and horror of mass violence and to take a stand against genocidal tendencies wherever and to whomever they occur. And it's not for IRA, really, to duplicate what other bodies are doing. But there are important lessons to be drawn from the Holocaust experience which are relevant to current efforts to prevent genocides recurring. The problem always seems to be that when we look back at savage events, we ask, why did we not act sooner? Why are we always too late? How can we erect fire breaks to prevent the spread and escalation of random violence into something altogether more calculated and extreme? This is a universal challenge. I must say it, it's a great privilege to share this session with uh, the Aegis Trust, which has done such important and pioneering work and shown what an impact private initiatives can have in this field. I should like to highlight uh, two conclusions and, and four lessons. The first conclusion is that the strongest barrier against prejudice is the ethical strength of a society. Values of tolerance and mutual understanding need to be inculcated into the young and reinforced throughout life. They have to be based on a good understanding of history, which is where education and a culture of remembrance are so important. And civil society obviously has a key role here to play. Holocaust research is providing an ever sounder basis for understanding how societies can descend into mass violence against the very people among whom they live. Holocaust remembrance 
reminds us of how fragile our societies can be and that progress, modernity, intellectual achievement, technological advance and good intentions are absolutely no guarantee that darker instincts will not ultimately prevail. Holocaust education, however, should give our societies the confidence to move forward in a more humane and enlightened way. Material progress does not guarantee ethical progress, hence the wisdom of constantly remembering and teaching the events of 70 years ago, which sought to destroy a whole people, whoever and wherever they were. For IRA, education is the key. We have supported hundreds of projects all over the world. Our experts have developed comprehensive guidelines for teaching about the Holocaust. The Holocaust is taught and studied in almost every country of the world. Uh, I know that in the UK there are people who have been teaching in China now for 10 years uh, to avid audiences. Central to this work is for societies and governments to think hard about why they want the Holocaust to be taught and how best to do it. I'll return to that point in a moment. The second conclusion is that we have to pay close attention to what is happening and recognize the dangerous signs when we see them. You would have thought that modern communications would ensure that we can no longer hide behind professions of ignorance as so many did in the past when Armenians or Jews were being murdered or Bosnians or Rwandans. We've been reminded today, indeed, of how much preparation for genocide often takes place in advance of the atrocities themselves. We know more than ever about the origins, the economic and historical origins of communal strife or the persecution of minorities in the Middle East or West Africa, but yet too often we still cannot prevent the violence taking place. But in particular, we all have a duty to watch the trends and the opinion polls within our own societies, honestly, and with a practical determination to take action against prejudice, anti-Semitism, Holocaust or genocide denial, uh, genocide denial, against historical revisionism, or other worrisome trends, sooner rather than later. Civil society and parliamentary representatives play a major part and must play a major part in monitoring changes in societal attitudes and giving early warning signals of trouble ahead. As we've all learnt so often in the past, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. So the four lessons. First, I suggest that all societies should recognise the imperative need to combat and counter hate speech and hate crimes in all their forms at the earliest possible moment before racial, religious and ethnic abuse becomes so frequent, loud and mainstream that it coarsens political discourse and threatens the safety and well-being of a country's inhabitants, whether they are citizens or not. This imperative need becomes an urgent obligation when inflammatory speech and hate crimes threaten to turn into incitement to violence. To take an example from uh, my own country, the UK, uh, the uh, Community Security Trust set up some years ago to um, protect uh, the Jewish community and its uh, um, community activities uh, took on upon itself the, the role of, of uh, developing a much more rigorous and um, uh, scientific approach to uh, tracking hate, hate crimes, hate speech, etc., and uh, produced such good work that it's been adopted by the British government and by the police. Uh, and been Im copied and imitated elsewhere in Europe. Uh, that was a community civil society initiative uh, which uh, filled a very, uh, very, very uh, necessary gap. The second thing is that societies must understand, protect and promote the central importance of the rule of law and the duty of judges to uphold the law against populist pre pressures. I mean, that obviously was one of the, the big uh, problems back in the 1930s. Citizens and non-citizens alike must be able to trust the legal system and those empowered to enforce the laws to stand up 
for the democratic and constitutional rights of all citizens and all those within the protection of the state. This is just as true at the international level where states must not be allowed to think that they can break established laws or codes of conduct with impunity. Thirdly, a heavy responsibility rests on the press and the media to report impartially, fearlessly and frankly, neither fanning the flames of prejudice nor buckling under to threats from political or societal forces intent on whipping up prejudice. Fourthly, it's vital to remember. It's vital to remember. In all the genocides, the perpetrators try to hide the evidence. The Nazis certainly did. As time passes, trees and shopping mouths grow over the mass graves. Other atrocities get in the way. The historical memory in, all, in us all gets confused and fuzzy. But the Holocaust of the Jews was unprecedented in its cold-blooded single-mindedness. It is the paradigm, as Professor Yehuda Bauer says, it's the most extreme version of genocide ever known. It has lessons and it must be remembered, not forgotten. So let me conclude by stressing Holocaust education. The Holocaust is essential to our understanding of genocide and mass violence. It is the most extensively documented, the best researched, and perhaps the best understood example of genocide in the long history of man's inhumanity to man. So it offers us important insights into why and how societies can descend into mass violence. Studying the Holocaust reveals the full range of human behavior from the most appalling acts of violence to behavior of extraordinary resilience, courage, and altruism. From the moral complexities of collaboration, collusion, and complicity to the dangers of bowing to peer pressure or apathy. The profound questions it raises about the human condition makes Holocaust education ideal, if that's not the wrong word, for stimulating independent inquiry in our schools and universities across a range of key ages and subjects. How is it possible that not long ago and not far from, when it, from where many of us live, people in Europe collaborated in the murder of their Jewish neighbors? Why didn't people do more to save them? How does the genocide of European Jewry relate to the other atrocities committed by the Nazis? The genocide of the Roma and Sinti, the mass murder of disabled people, the genocide of Poles and Slavs, the persecution and murder of political opponents, Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals and others. How did the victims respond to it? How far did they resist the unfolding genocide? How did the bystanders react? It is by comparing the Holocaust to other genocides that we can more sharply understand both the differences and the similarities. Understand what leads some societies to enter into orgies of destruction. To understand what are the most effective preventative measures and how best to recognize the risks of future genocides and act in a timely fashion. Thank you very much.